This series of lunchtime conversations intends to capture insights from some of society's thought leaders, given the unprecedented times we're living in. It's the 29th of May and the UK feels like it's opening back up. It's reassuring, in fact, to hear that some of my kinsfolk up in the west coast of Scotland are complaining about it being too hot. And part of my role at Warwick University is to make sure our programmes remain relevant and continue to serve the needs of society. To do this, it's important to be part of the research and industry community. The people I'm speaking to in this series form my professional network and I rely on them to inform and steer our educational offerings. We've seen seismic shifts in all areas of life and the extraordinarily pervasive nature of COVID-19 will have lasting effects. To discuss this, my lunchtime guest today is Steve McLaughlin, management consultant and lecturer. So welcome to lunch, Steve. Thank you, Mary. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> You've taken your expertise as a service professional to many different sectors. There's two that stand out particularly to me because on the surface, at least, they appear to be so distinct. You were head of customer management strategy and head of service improvement for Lloyd's TSB, the bank, but I know you went on to work with a mental health trust in the improvement of their services. What did you notice about the differences between the two organisations and possibly any sort of surprising similarities between them? And how did your expertise span those two different sectors? Well, I think with uh, Lloyd's TSB, um, one of the larger financial services organisations in the world, the clear focus of that organisation is on shareholder value. So pretty much everything is shaped around driving that value. Mm. Um, very strong commercial drive, clearly, and sadly that can overreach itself. And, and that has been seen really in terms of the, the PPI episodes that we've seen over re recent years, which has cost tens of billions of pounds. Um, contrast that with the uh, National Health Service, where to a very large extent, you know, we are the shareholders and we are also the customers. And that strong overlap, I think, results in a, a, a relative lack of focus or um, difficulty for executives in decision making. Um, they've clearly got a wider social purpose and um, the demand they face is really unwanted demand. You know, no one sets up a hospital with, a, with wanting to fill it, fill it with people. And again, the pandemic that uh, we're going through at the moment shows that, that, that that demand is not demand. It's not good demand. It's, 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 mm. it's demand we don't really want. Um, then I think in terms of uh, senior management decision making across the two organisations, in, in Lloyds Bank, there, there was that clear focus at Lloyds and Lloyds, and Lloyds TSB, there was that clear focus. In, in the NHS, there's a, a, a lot more uh, forces at work which make that decision making much, much more difficult. Um, in regards to similarities, I mean, I'm not sure that there, there, there are an awful lot um, that uh, if I was to say where the stronger NHS organisations that I work with had taken learning from commercial uh, uh, organisations or, or, or private sector organisations. I think it would be in, in terms of that executive focus, clarity of strategy, clarity of purpose, and then a, a more ruthless execution as, as opposed to a totally ruthless execution. You know, that, that, that much stronger focus and drive from yes. leadership. Yeah. Mm, yeah, OK, OK, so um, I guess the the different trusts within um, the NHS will all manage themselves in different ways. Is that right? The decision making processes are there within the sector? Are they similar or are there differences from one trust to the other? I, I, I my uh, view on it is that they're every trust is unique. Uh, mm. they, they run within the same parameters, the broad set of rules, but um, executives have a lot of discretion as to how they go about doing things. 
and because there are so many areas in which they can do things differently mm. moving from one trust to another you might as well you you feel you were in a completely different organization is that is that the same with Lloyd's TSB or is there more homogeneity between <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, I, I well it, it I'm, I'm chuckling because I, I was um, a, too many years ago to say but um, I, I was party to a conversation between the then chief executive of Lloyds Bank and one of the regional directors and at that time the bank was split into nine regions and the chief executive asked the regional director a question about how something was done and he said well it depends on where you are <laughs> and then in explaining that got the response from the chief executive who was um, Brian Pittman or Sir Brian Pittman who was one of the more well-known characters in banking at the time and um, you know he said well so what you're telling me is I've got nine banks and and sort of the answer was well yes really and the structure of the bank changed very quickly after that to again re-centralize control and but it's uh, saying well so there's this these models where you have more centralized control more distributed control the risk is with the more distributed controls you actually get these differences and drawing the question across to the NHS you know the found the idea of foundation trust was that you or that you delegate more responsibility to local executives and managers thus you have those differences emerging well, yeah. thank you thank you thanks for sharing that um, <laughs> the, um through the pandemic i think one of a key word that is coming through or a key theme that's coming through is, is resilience so as, as a concept it's come up many times and um, as we start to build the future to make a more resilient society and a more resilient organization more resilient workforce and um, do you think that some sectors are just more resilient than others and um, or do you think it's more about functions or areas and um, or where do you feel we can make or we need to make better attention and improvements so that we are able to be more resilient Um, I think the first part of your question is, you know, do some areas, some industry sectors seem to be more resilient than mm. others? And I would say generally, yes. I mean, so it, it, with the pandemic, clearly demand for certain products and services has literally skyrocketed, thus placing any supply chain under under extreme pressure. Mm. Um, having said that, um, if I look within the, the sector of, say, healthcare or um, uh, a wider range of services around healthcare, care for the elderly, care for people with learning disability, you've got a, a quite a wide range of different types of organisation there and I have links with several different types and what I'm seeing is a difference in 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 the scale of challenge around things like PPE so one organization which I'm a non-executive director for whilst they have been completely without difficulty they have at no point looked like running out of PPE for staff uh, uh, for working with people similarly mm -hmm. The care home that my father is in i mean they have not had a single case of coronavirus either amongst staff or amongst the, the residents and they have more than 60 residents um and again what you'd start to look at say well why is there that difference and then when you look at it, it you can you can identify key strengths in management uh, you know management awareness insight into what's going around preparedness uh, to say as soon as the first signs of challenge arise going through the process of thinking what it means and saying so where do we need to act and act quickly mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I look at the national picture um, then uh, it looks like and we have to face that uh, where there were opportunities to create a more resilient situation or and or a more resilient um, supply chain those opportunities were really overlooked and it's I'm, I'm not clear I, I don't have 
insight or information which would tell me why it just looks like they were overlooked really yeah mm. well, it's, it's like planning forward you know we often talk about and um, the importance of um certainly in the courses we deliver we talk about scenario planning and um, we ask our students to have a little go at doing some scenario planning and um, as a tool to build resilience in the future and um, I guess I'm guessing that scenario planning for a pandemic is now kind of almost irrelevant because we're living it, we're going through it. So we're kind of maybe moving now towards lessons learned from having had been through or going through a pandemic. If I was thinking about scenario planning for the future, how how would I second guess or what would what how would I build up those scenarios and um, to be able to inform and um, how do you start? Where do you start is the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK, so. Um, in, in to the extent that I've actually been involved in scenario planning, which was with Lloyds Bank and Lloyds Lloyds TSP, um, you you think about your environment and the most important aspects of that environment for your point of view and then you try to imagine a period of time in the future a a range of options and a, a, a simple example would be so what are interest rates going to do mm. so if interest rates today base rate is 0.1 percent uh, you'd be trying to imagine what interest rates might be doing in three four five maybe ten years time and then you take other factors uh, of your operation and, and think about and, and you, you would always have a range. You'd have a, a range of the most pessimistic forecast and a range of the most optimistic forecast. And then when you started to test those, you could possibly narrow that range. And then you would start to apply that thinking to other elements of your key operating environment. So, for example, an airline might be saying, so what will demand be like? And I, I think very few airlines three, four, five years ago would say, well, just around the middle of 2020, early part of 2020, demand will fall to zero. <laughs> you know, I, I just don't think that would have been in anyone's. Um, yes. Path. And, and, and rightly so. No one would have uh, uh, understood or accepted that. So the, the challenge is then is that you've got a number of different aspects and you've got to try to build a scenario out of those different. And of course, you can have many combinations. If you've got six or seven factors and three or four different options in each factor, you've got a very large number of scenarios that can be built out. So th through a process of iteration, you decide on, you know, one or two that seem to be the most likely and plan and plan for that. Yes. You don't, and then obviously the real situation emerges. Y your strategy, though, would still be based upon um, achieving um, performance and financial objectives. Uh, mm. but, but being aware that these challenges, you know, different challenges may arise as you go along. Mm. Yes, yeah, I guess, I mean, you know, we've had interest from this series from from my, my community at Warwick. There's been interest about finding that balance between data and qualitative and decision making and gut instinct. And and, and I, I get, you know, there's clearly data is critical to look at how organizations are behaving and it can be um really strong to give you a historical perspective but then you you must have some form of trying to understand and manage your future if you want to be in any way prepared and rather than just react to what's happening and you you just you have to look for other the other ways of making sense of that and yeah, mm. yeah uh, well i think uh, what one something that springs to mind as you as you say that is that there's I read a book last year called The Road to Ruin mm -hmm. uh, which is written by an author who was involved in American bank the American banking system during the financial crash of 2008-9 and what what he's writing so the book published last year 2019 is saying uh, we have learned nothing as a system <laughs> uh, the definition of learning being things have changed, you know, in, in order for you to evidence learning, you, you need to evidence change, change of behavior, change of ways of doing things. And uh, what he was saying is very little has changed. Mm. And the net, there is another financial shock coming, but he couldn't predict where it was coming from. 
and was very open in saying that, well, this is it. Yes. And I, yeah. I, I think very few financial forecasters would have said, oh, yes, a pandemic's coming around the corner. Yeah, and there'll be a second shock. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, as well as lecturing for us at Warwick, which um, on my programmes, I'm very grateful for, and you do a fantastic job with our students. So thank you very much for that. But as well as doing that, you also lecture at an FE college. So I'm HE, uh, higher education, but you also are part of the further education landscape. Um, from your, from from where you're seeing it, from your perspective, what what do you think are the main differences between FE and HE? Um, uh, and and I, or, or indeed, again, the similarities. What are the similarities between the two? Uh, how do you view how do you view your experiences from both? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for your kind words. And, and, and I just have to say, I, I really enjoy my work with Warwick University and, and WMG and the students and the students there. Um, as I say, I also work in the further education environment uh, for a for a college in Somerset. Um, and again, I, I enjoy that work as well. It, the, the, the key differences uh, that strike me really are scale of the organisation. So mm. Warwick University, WMG, very, very large organisation. The further education college I work with, although it's relatively large, it's 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 very small in a comparison with Warwick. Um, the scale of funding is quite different. The scale of provision is quite different. And I would say the breadth and depth of uh, expertise that you would get at Warwick University or have access to at Warwick University is far greater than you would see at the Further Education College I work with. Having said that, um, the Further Education College had or has ambition to establish some form of higher education stroke university uh, setup and actually there is a brand called University College of Somerset um, uh, out there and and I work in that brand uh, with with some students doing business, business management degrees. Um, the really the selling point for that in a further education college is uh, around students who perhaps don't see um, the need or want to take the financial risk of going to you know, away from home to a large university, which can be very, very expensive. But, yes. I, but I would say that you know, what I would like to see, frankly, is I, I don't think that college can really, really compete with, with a Warwick or a, or, a, or a WMG in terms of that world class education, academic, experience and therefore I, what I would like to see is far greater partnership and I'd like to see that in the future now how can we part so if we think about the environment through which we're talking to each other at the moment could students that I work with benefit from expertise from Warwick through mm -hmm. such a channel you know and that sort of thing so much stronger partnership working mm, that's a that's a, an interesting that is a really interesting idea you know mm -hmm. to look at and um, make maybe putting slightly more formal structures in place for Warwick community. And um, so at the moment, you know, I, of course, I love the Warwick community I have, and I see you as part of that. Um, but I could see that, you know, structurally, there, there isn't anything in place particularly to support that. So, yeah. um, so I recognise, although I think there's some value, it's a merit in the fact that it remains a community because we want it to be, and it's yeah. individual energies. Um, rather than kind of obliging it in some kind of structural way, but certainly interesting to explore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And sorry, you're going to say? Well, I, no, I, I just going to say it, it's, that's it is a sort of top of the head idea. You know, it's part of a stream of consciousness as opposed to a pre-planned statement. But it's just, it's just in thinking about your question about the differences but then how could you make the strengths and the brilliance of uh, you know Warwick and some of the people that work there or the people that work there available um, mm. to, to students in the FE stroke more local environments and, and uh, you know, it'd be very very interesting thing to, to think about. Yeah. Food for thought Steve. Food for exactly. Thought. Yeah. Um, so now you've been working at home with uh, a few generations of the McLaughlin family and um, to keep you company, keep you on track. How do you see the world of work 
um, transforming or changing um, for, for people in positions like yourself, your sort of management consultant roles and this this passion you have for for a kind of external guest lecturing mm. into different um, educational organisations. How do you think that's going to change in the future and are the, are the things positives as well as negatives? Yeah, well, yeah, so, so moving uh, into the online world of uh, teaching, if I'll call it that for, for the moment, um, has been a very interesting transformation. Uh, the um, I, I'm particularly interested in a co comment from a, a colleague, one of the senior management team at the college I work with, saying, "You know, we've been thinking about doing this for about three years, and it's all all been thought of as a, a bit expensive, a bit difficult, or whatever. And here we are, three weeks after <laughs> a, a COVID warning, we're doing it." So yeah. that's that's a very interesting point of itself in terms of change and change leadership, leadership of management. Um, through through the pandemic, I, I've predominantly been working with groups of um, management and leadership apprentices. So these are people who are in work, experience the pandemic from a work perspective, and they're also doing a, a course of study and planning to, to, to become uh, management and leadership apprentices uh, um, uh, and, qu and qualified. Um, so it's been like a, uh, an observatory, a laboratory working with them and finding out how things are changing for them, how it's affecting them in their, their world of work and, and, and the world of uh, working for the apprenticeship. Some of the interesting things they feel that initially, in the initial phases, they were very much more productive working at home. And I would say that. Yes. Uh, there's some sense that that productivity is falling away as they start a bit later each day and perhaps finish a bit earlier um, and really some uh, distractions can can creep in um, but I have, I've no uh, so I've no doubt though that this is part of the the way forward mm. I, I mean clearly I, I, I'm certain that we will simply not just go back to doing the way th things the way we were doing them three four months ago in let's say three or four months time I think the world has forever changed in that point of view mm. so I think you know, how do we learn to do things really really well in the online environment um, you know to maintain groups of people's engagement in that environment to ensure that learning is taking place and to be able to sort of measure that in the moment you yes. know, new tools and techniques so I, I think that's a really interesting part of the challenge going forward very exciting actually as well mm. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for sharing these insights. Um, for me, you know that I find your insights enormously useful um, to help steer our educational programmes. For our current students, these insights might, might help inform their current research. Um, and for the wider Warwick community, the insights are valuable to hear and, and it, it, it's reassuring to hear from the wider world. If anyone listening to this would like to hear more from Steve, please drop me a line and I'll forward on. I'm on Warwick's website. And if you're watching this on YouTube, follow the link on the closing slide. This series will also be made available as a podcast. Just search Insights Over Lunch on your preferred listening platform. So, Steve, I guess uh, no more to say apart from uh, bon appetit and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>